today we're going to be looking at how do you ask questions, how do you answer questions using science. And we're going to particularly clarify one really widespread misunderstanding that confuses a lot of students and science teachers. But if this is clear to you, then when you're out in the field with your nature journal, you're going to find that your ability to do science right there in the field goes way up just by this one little tweak and clarification. You may have heard me sort of, uh, uh, sort of break this down before. When you think about questions, I think first and foremost of three types of questions. And the first type of question, um, I, we call these could it be. So a could it be question are things that you can answer by your own direct observation. So um, if you are wondering about, you know, when do the golden crown sparrows um, return to the San Francisco Bay Area in the winter? Um, they've been up in Alaska. When do they return back down here? All you have to do is go outside and start looking and bring your calendar and just kind of go like, nope, not today. Nope, not today. Nope, not today. Oh, hey, golden crown sparrows are back, right? And so you can answer this question by your own direct observation. Um, when you are doing this, a few things that you have to keep in mind are one is that maybe there was just this, there, there was, imagine that there was a golden crown sparrow who was just really precocious and decided to leave Alaska way ahead of everybody else and you happen to see that one. Um, so what is your sample size? Right, is this based on one observation or, um, you know, are you seeing, you know, golden crown sparrows returning around then on a lot of different locations? You might have the first one, when, but, you know, when is, what is, what is kind of the, the typical thing? You might have to, um, your one golden crown sparrow in your backyard may not be the, the, the best clue to that. So you want to think of when you are answering things from your own direct observations, are you just looking at one example or are you looking at multiple? And in doing this, the second big factor of thinking about could it be is the possibility for bias, right? So um, am I just looking in the San Francisco Bay Area um, or in a particular habitat? Um, a, a kind of a good example of this, when I was in college for a project that I did, um, I took maps of Tilden Park, to East Bay Regional Park near my house. I took maps of Tilden Park and on it, I found and located and mapped in the locations of all the dusky footed wood rat nests that I could find. And then I looked at my map and then made determinations about what kinds of habitats that they preferred, right? Now, there were some, um, so here is a little road going along here, a little road going along here. Um, this is kind of how the, the pattern that I got. Um, you know, here are these roads and when you got off of these, there were big poison oak thickets in between these. And I didn't want to go out there. And so what I ended up mapping is all of the dusky footed wood rat nests that were convenient for me to get to without going into poison oak. So by going around and, and so if I, 
if I had gone in here, I'm sure that these areas would have been filled with other dusky footed wood rats. I'm not sure, but they very well could have been. But I made all these sort of pronouncements and kind of determinations of what I could see and kind of characteristics of the habitat, but it was restricted to the places that I wanted to go. So it was a really, a really biased way of looking at that. So when you are answering things from your own observations, you want to be aware of your own potential for bias, right? So how is the way that you are collecting data and information to answer your question, is this sort of sampling all that could be sampled? So this is why we want to think of sample size and bias are really important things to, to to, to, be, to do in this. And sometimes it could it be question, you kind of have to defer for later. Um, and so like you might need to come back with a black light, you might need to come back at night, you might need to um, get on a Tyvek suit so you don't get poison oak and kind of, but um, you know, but, but all those, anything that you can answer just by looking at it, that's the way we get all that information. And this, this is a lot of the natural history information that we get about animals. It comes from people just sitting around on a stump and looking at gophers. And then we just learned something about gophers because somebody sat around and you looked at the gophers. And now we know this is what gophers do because look, we looked at the gophers, right? But still, you want to keep those two things in mind. So those are the could it be questions. I'm sorry. Whoa. Um, Sometimes when you're uh, just kind of jumping into your talk and you're not really thinking too much about what you're, you're, you're saying, um, well, that's embarrassing. Um, this whole thing about me starting with the title saying, could it be? Um, th th I was then talking about direct observation, which had nothing to do with could it be. These are the let's see questions. <laughs> Awkward. All right. Forget what I said about could it be. The could it be is there going to be the next category of questions? So I'm sorry if I just destroyed anybody's sketch notes that you were making. Um, so let's see questions. Let's see questions. Those are all about your observations, not your could it be. So category number one is let's see. And I want to really contrast that with the could it be's. So you see why I call this one, let's see? It's because you go and you see, right? And, but the could it be questions, um, could it be questions are things that you cannot answer by your direct observations. Um, and, but you may be able to use what's called inference. And here's the way that this works, right? Let's say I notice that um, I notice that the wood rat nests, sometimes they were out on their own, that sometimes there were these little clusters of a bunch of nests all close to each other. With let's see, I can say here's the pattern. Some wood rat nests are on their own and other places you will find these little wood rat nest clusters. With let's see, I can describe the pattern, but with let's see, I can't answer why. So if I was wondering why are there some clusters of wood rat nests, I cannot directly observe why, right? I, I'm not a wood rat. I'm not in the mind of the wood rat. So a why question is a great example of a could it be question. And what happens when I do this is the way I approach this, <clears throat> I can't do it through direct observation, but when I realize I have a could it be question, what I do is I make what's called a why web. And this is what it looks like. So I write my question down. And then the Y web, I'm going to try to generate 
several different possible answers, right? Um, so let's actually crowdsource this right now. Um, unmute yourself if you have, you know, you're, if you notice this pattern, some wood rat nests in little clusters, right? What are some possible explanations of why that could be? Uh, unmute yourself and tell me one or two. Maybe a family unit. All right. Family units. Great, great. Give me another. They're very social. Um, so they are social. And not not necessarily family. They could be, you know, like friends. Okay, some sort of social social groups. So there are certain sort of things that there's there's something that is kind of bonding these things together, and others are in the out group. Great. What's Plenty another possibility? Lots of materials. Oh, it's there's in those areas. There's good stuff to build nests right. from. Very cool. See how, see how this is a totally different kind of thinking than that? Mm -hmm. Access to food in that location. Ah, better food. So this is materials for nests that in a place, so in this area, the food is scarce, the critters are spread out. There are these food is clustered. And so the wood rats are clustered, right? Fewer predators. Well, say again. Fewer predators. Ah. And maybe related to that could be safety in numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's your sister group. All right. Um, so, so that might so, decrease so, so with the social groups that may be safety in numbers. Right. So for instance, if it is that they're in these social groups, perhaps that is because there is safety in numbers. Um, so I can tag that onto there. So I'm going to stop it right here and just put in one more item. And that is, I'm going to put in a question mark to represent or something else that we just haven't thought of yet, oh. <laughs> right? So with that, I actually have all the possibilities included because whenever you put in or something else that I haven't thought of yet, that includes everything else, right? So you always want to put that into your Y web, just one little arrow pointing to a question mark to remind you that this is not the full constellation of the possibilities. So this is really useful because if you just were to stop at the first logical thing that popped into your head, well, these may be family units. Then you might write into your notes, I found a family unit of, I found a family group of wood rats. And because that explanation comes to your mind easily, because of it's what's called the availability heuristic, because it comes to our mind easily, we tend to think it's more correct. So the first idea that comes to us gets extra points because it's the first thing that comes to us. But if we're intentionally making a Y web, so when we realize that this is not something that I can directly observe, but it is, <clears throat> but it is, um, a why question, then I know that the structure of it is going to be like this. So a web of arrows pointing to different possibilities. And what I now know I have to do is put in a bunch of these different possibilities and something else that I haven't thought of yet. So when you're out with students in the field or when you're out with your own nature journal somewhere and you, you, you come across a little mystery, and you go like, huh, why is that, right? That's interesting. I wonder why that is. What you can do, moment. Start recording information about it. Like I was looking at this little cluster of, of ants. Um, do, 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 do. Where are those little ants? Little ants, little ants, where are you? I know you're in this book. Yeah, no ants there, no ants there. 
Um, I found myself a little ant nest. Huh. Move closer towards the front of the book. Here. Oh, it's bees. There's the bees. You can see the Wild Wonder Conference passing by there. The ant had a really good Y web. I thought it was in this journal, but it wasn't. <laughs> Should have had this queued up before my talk. Ah, well, here's a little Y web. Um, so I was looking at bees, um, and um, I noticed that. Um, you know, the, it was a heat wave and there are all these bees that were coming to this little artificial creek, right? And um, it was mostly all bees coming there. It wasn't a bunch of other insects. I saw a couple of other flies that came and one little wasp showed up and tons of bees. So, and then it made me think of like, you know, bees seem to be, you know, here really hitting the water right now. Nobody else is. Um, how much water does does a, a, a bee need, and why? Um, so, is it for drinking, for for um, honey production? Is it for cooling? Um, so, trying to figure out why they are um, taking so much water here. I had sort of several different possibilities sticking out from those little critters. Um, I found a squirrel and it was licking the deck. Why was the squirrel licking the deck? Was it salt? Was it spoiled food that was on the deck? Or is it something else? Right? So anytime I have, I, I make an observation, I can, even without, if I don't, I could like, I could write why is it licking the deck, or here I just so was licking the deck, and I immediately kind of went into different possibilities of what that is. That is sort of make. Oh, there's my ants. <clears throat> Look at this. So these ants, I discovered that here's my little timeline. Um, uh, it's noon, sun goes down, and somewhere around before 9 p.m., the ants come out and they start foraging, and sometime before 6 a.m they go back underground. So why are they coming out at night, right? They were coming out at night to do all their foraging. And um, here is a why web about that. So why aren't they doing it during the day? Could be to avoid heat, avoid predators, avoid drying out or something else, right? On their trails, they were bringing material in both directions. Why were they taking material and in both directions carrying stuff. You'd expect them only to be to carrying material towards the nest, right? Were they confused? Were they making a new nest site? Were they cleaning their nest site? Or is it something else? So you see in both of these why questions, my next response is alternate hypotheses. So the official name for these po different possibilities is alternate hypotheses. And that's what you do with a why question. That's how you start a why question. So when you get a why question, if once you're familiar with this, this, this pattern, you know exactly the next thing you need to do. You need to now jump in and find the different possibilities. Oh, it's a why question. If it's a let's see question, you can start observing. With a why question, I build a why web. Now, with any one of these, actually, let, let, let me just throw in the third category. And um, so this is direct observation. This is inference. There is a third category. And what the third category is called is let it be. Now, the let it be is a special category. 
for things where there is no evidence. In the absence of evidence, we cannot taste, test any claims or any explanations. If I had, if I were wondering, <clears throat> how does the acorn feel about the weevil, right? I don't have anywhere of kind of getting into the heart of the little acorn and, and, and understanding its, its kind of emotional response to the weevil that's been chewing at it, right? I don't have any way of collecting data on that. But still, it's fun to ask those sorts of questions. And this can be done with poetry. It can be done with philosophy. It's fun to think about these sorts of things. But when we are doing something and there is no evidence that we can bring to bear to assess that, we just have to realize that this is a third category and this one is outside of the realm of science. So in science, we can only play in areas where we have, we can either make direct observations or use inference. So observation and inference are our toolkit. But when you can neither do inference nor observation, it's this other category of questions and they're fun, but they're different, right? And when we're doing this, we need to know that we're not doing science. It's still a good thing to do. There are lots of good things to do that aren't science, right? But it's just not science. So having that distinction really helps me be clear. So if I can infer or directly observe, um, then I am in the, the, this is the realm of science. This is outside of science. Science, not science. And so there's one last piece in this, and that is, so what does, let's take a closer look at the could it be question. You notice that in my journal, I stopped with these questions, right? Um, I, I stopped those, 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 those questions here. So I just, with my why question, I came up with some possibilities. Is that the end of the road? It's not. Let's just take a closer look at this and see what the inference looks like, right? Each one of these possibilities, there is an official term for these possibilities that you came up with. And these are what are called hypotheses. Hypotheses are possible explanations for a phenomenon that you see. Specifically, a testable explanation. So let's take a look at this one here. Let's take this materials one, right? What you do when you're doing inference is you say to yourself, well, here's this idea. In these areas, there's more materials. And in other areas, there's going to be less materials. And that's why they're in clusters. <clears throat> if this is true, so here's where it kind of, here's where the rubber meets the road. I'm gonna say, write this down. If true, comma, then what would you expect to see? If it were that they are clustered because in these areas there's more materials, what would you expect to see? And from this, we're going to generate, so actually I'm gonna flip the page. Right, and I'm just going to take this one ideal, the materials hypothesis. And what we're going to do is from the materials hypothesis, 
we're going to do something cool. We say if true, then what would I expect to see? So let's try this thought experiment ourselves. If it, they were gathering, you have more areas in, in, in places where um, there is more materials. As I walk around, can anybody think of an experimental manipulation or something that you should be able to see just by walking around in the place? That would be a prediction. The hypothesis is going to lead to predictions. What are some predictions you would make if that were true? You can unmute yourself and add those. Um, areas where there's more wood, wood on the ground that's easy to pick up would be have more Sure. Wood sure. Um, so <clears throat> more fallen, fallen debris. Friends. Yeah. Um, in group. Uh, oh. Group uh, areas. Right. So I would expect areas um, where there are groups to have better access to, uh, I would expect to find more stuff on the ground there. Mm -hmm. you need to build a nest. And less in, in, in areas where they're not. Right. Okay. What else would I expect to see? Or an experimental manipulation that I could do to kind of play with this? Um, we'll pick up all the stuff. <laughs> right. So, um, so if I remove material, I, if I remove material from the area, um, I would expect um, at least no new nests. Yeah. Right? Yep. You could go the other way if you added material ah. to a crop that didn't have much, you could then see if it increased. So if I bring in a bunch of great yeah. material, so I'm putting boxes around some of these experimental manipulations. If I add material into a place, I would expect to see new nests. Yep. Now, um, so isn't that interesting? The hypothesis leads to predictions. In each one of these cases, this is also the place where the term assumptions comes in, right? So assumptions are hiding between, um, uh, are, are, are sort of uh, there between each of these predictions. So for instance, I am assuming that I know the right kind of material. Yeah. Yep. Right? I, I'm, I'm assuming that I can look at the diameter of branches and things, and if I kind of match that on these, the diameter and the lengths, that's what they're looking for. They may be looking for the smell of the wood, and, and, and I'm bringing in wood with the wrong smell. But I'm assuming here that the material that I'm bringing in is good nesting material, right? Was there any other uh, assumption that would be in here? Uh, let's see. Well, it, that material is um, is causing it. I mean, you're, you're testing that, but it could be something else entirely mm -hmm. different. That, that that's right. So, it, it, but here in in this in in. What we're doing is we're just, we're, for, for now, we're just sort of going to say, if this is true, right, yeah. what do I expect to see? And going down here, the idea, if I add material, we'll get new nests. Um, I'm assuming that the wood rats move in, around enough to be able to discover an area where there are, uh, yeah. where there's good material, right? Okay, I so I, I assume that the, the wood rats 
are sampling potential areas. Yeah. And you can sample some of their nests to find out what's in them and how they're built so that you know what kind of material. Right. So, you know, so basically I say, if these things are true, right? If these things are true, these assumptions are true, then if I add this material, I would expect to see this. These are not necessarily true, but if I can be explicit and state then, I will say that, you know, if this is true, right? Then I would expect if I add material, I'm gonna see new nests appearing in that area. So then I go and I add those nests or that material in there and sure enough, a whole bunch of wood rat nests appear in the places where I put more material. That supports this idea, right? And I can go like, wow, I mm -hmm. added material. And in those places where I added material, we got clusters of wood nests. That supports this material hypothesis. Or I could say, let's say mm -hmm. I found that that didn't happen. I could say, I put all this material out there, mm -hmm. right? And in those areas, we're not finding new nests. That doesn't support it. So this, mm -hmm. is, this is a test that I can do. I can test this, right? Or here I can make an observation. I walk out there and it turns out in those areas where there are clusters, like if there were not a whole bunch of bushes in those areas, and it was actually over here, there's a ton of materials, right? But where they are, there's just not a lot of stuff, Dangerous. Yeah. right? That would be evidence against this idea, mm -hmm. right? But notice in all of these cases, there. what I'm doing, I'm saying, if this is true, I would expect to see this, right? And there also are these assumptions between you and each one of your predictions. Yeah, we're also assuming that they wouldn't just expand and have bigger nests. Maybe they wouldn't build new ones. Ah, ah, <laughs> great, great. So, um, so you, you, anytime you are, are, anything that you can add to your assumptions list, yeah, yeah. you want to be as explicit as you can about those. But do you yeah. see how this area here is much more murky yes. than finding out whether or not they live in groups? That I can go out and directly observe. If I'm trying to figure out why, what I've done is taken one of these hypotheses, right? And I just started to play with it. I started to say, if that's true, then I would expect to see this and this and this and this and this and this. Now let's imagine for a moment that I went out with this material hypothesis idea in my head. I add material into areas and I get no new nests. I remove material from areas and I still can make it more difficult to find material in this area. And I still find that the new nests are appearing even when I have removed materials from an area where there, is a, where there are other nests. And let's say I find that this, this, the sticks of the diameter that the wood rats use is just as easy to find where I have clusters and where I have single nests. All of those would suggest to me that if my predictions are correct, if my assumptions are correct, it's probably not this material's hypothesis. Yeah, it might be food. Yes, exactly. But what I've done is I've just, I'm, there's all those other possibilities out there. And what I did is I just went into one little corner of it and started messing around with one part of one idea, right? By adding this materials in here, this is an experiment in one part, one way of testing this hypothesis. And if I find from a lot of different directions that the answer is nope, 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 and nope, then what I can do is I can come back here 
And here's the critical part. Am I able to say it is definitely not the materials hypothesis? Why or why not? You can unmute yourself. This is the key question. Let me repeat the question. Let's say I went and I found a lot by, by doing this kind of doing the deep dive on these. I found out that um, that all my experiments and my observations did not support this idea of materials. Can I come back here and say it's definitely not materials? In the senses. It seems like the only way you could eliminate it would be if you had really thoroughly explored all the possibilities all them, and yeah. gone to that, that, was... that last question mark. Cool. Um, I, I'm finding strong evidence against it. It seems like you could only say probably not because there's always that chance that there's something you didn't think of. Exactly. What if some of my assumptions are wrong? Or asking different questions about, about the same assumption, perhaps. Right. So I can be a mistake in here can give me a result, or maybe I've just got a really small sample size, right? I can make a mistake in here with my experimental manipulation. I can have made a mistake with my assumptions and I could be wrong. So what I'm going to do here is instead of saying, no, it's not this materialist hypothesis. Yeah. I'm going to say probably not. Right. I'm going to say it's probably not that. And I could even say, um, I could even say very probably, right? But because I don't have, I'm trying to figure out how, I'm, I'm trying to understand the system by standing on the outside, looking at the behavior of this system, I, I may be making a mistake. I'm not going to have the hubris mm -hmm. to say it's definitely not this. I can say the evidence does not support this. There's strong evidence against this explanation. And so, and if it's really, really strong, I can say like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to ignore this one for now. If other evidence comes up, I can then take a look at that. And, uh, but it's, but it appears that it is not this materials hypothesis. But notice I'm couching all of that with this language of uncertainty, with perhaps, um, I, like, I believe that. The evidence doesn't show that. I have not proved that it is not materials. Proving is the language of mathematicians. Mathematicians write the rules for the system of Euclidean geometry that they're doing, and then they can do a proof. Scientists, when we're looking at the natural world around us, are not proving or disproving things. We are finding that for, for any little, um, any hypothesis which we're testing, we're finding if we get evidence that supports it or doesn't. And then imagine instead of true false or prove disproved, that there is a slider of your certainty. And you're going to move your certainty along that little slider and you're going to move it, it, the more evidence that supports it, you're going to move it more towards the supported side. The more evidence that doesn't support it, you're going to move it the other way. But it is not a matter of proving or disproving. So when people say scientists have proved that, they do not understand this fundamental idea of science. We're not in the business of proof disproof. That is for philosophers who can control the rules of their system. We're trying to understand the system by watching its behavior, and we have the humility to know that we may make mistakes. We will make mistakes. So what I can do is I say it's probably not this. I then will do the same thing over here with social groups, right? And then go, no, probably not, yeah. right? 
right? So I can say like, probably not. I can do the same thing with the food hypothesis and go, oh, probably not that, right? And I can do the same thing with the family units and go, oh, probably not that. But each one of these, it's, I'm going, I'm having to say, if this were true, what predictions would I make? Each one of those predictions gives me experiments or, or, or a cluster of observations that I would make that would either support or not support that. If you're doing a science, What's, sorry, yes, Chris. Yeah, I was just wondering if while you're doing that, is there a way that you can put them in a hierarchy though of possibility? So that, and that, that's exactly you know. what we do. We, we start with the ones that are most likely, right? Like I, I'm not going to start with UFO abductions, right? I'm gonna spin my wheels a lot <laughs> if I go out and do that. So um, I'm gonna start with whichever one I think seems the most probable to me. Right. And then let's, but let's imagine that this were all the possibilities that I could come up with. And I found evidence against all of those, <clears throat> except this one over here, the no predator zones, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I set up plates to look for tracks of animals, no predator tracks. I find predator tracks over here. Um, all these other sorts of things. Um, like, so there's, um, I, I set up little cameras to watch and I don't find predators in these zones. I set up cameras to watch over in the ones where they are um, um, singles out there. And I see predators walking through here, right? Have I proved that it is, they are in those areas because it's a no predator zone? Not really, just more likely. Exactly right. I have evidence that supports this hypothesis. The evidence support this hypothesis. I'm gonna move my slider on it. Now, what if every other possibility, what if every other possibility that I've thought of, I found really strong evidence against those? Does that make this true? I don't think so. That, it makes it more likely. Yeah. It makes it more that. likely. Yeah. It doesn't prove that it's true. No, you still got the other question mark. Might be too That's right. True. So now, so here's the thing. Um, Sherlock Holmes, an imaginary detective, right? <laughs> Sherlock Holmes famously said, right, that once you have eliminated the um, impossible, um, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, is the truth, my dear Watson. Is that correct? No. Sherlock Holmes is no. wrong. Sherlock Holmes yes. is wrong. Just because if you've eliminated these possibilities, it doesn't mean it's that. And the reason is, there's something else that you haven't thought of, or some of your assumptions in here could be wrong. So that's why we treat this area of inference, it's slower, it's painstaking. An experiment isn't it's just taking one little part of the food hypothesis and doing an experiment with that and then saying it supports or doesn't support that. You're not solving the problem, but you're moving us collectively towards a better understanding of what that is. And we're going to use that language of uncertainty. Right? That reminds me of something that we were taught in Spanish class and, and the sentence itself is sort of a joke. We were taught when in doubt, use subjunctive. And so <laughs> it makes me think of that when you say um, language of uncertainty, just to remember um, when in doubt, use subjunctive. <laughs> Get really, really used to, um, to using language of prob prob possibilities, but not certainties or like you said. Yes. Okay. Now, certainties, um, 
uh, so uh, in uh, in one of the Star Wars movies, um, um, as uh, oh no, look out! There's a spoiler coming up. Um, as um, as young Anakin Skywalker is turning into Darth Vader in his final um, fight with Ben Kenobi, his mentor. Um, he says, you're either with, with me or against me, um, to which his wise mentor reply, replies, only Siths deal in absolutes, which is interestingly an absolute statement, right? Um, but uh, so, and, but, but here's the thing, if, so, so these absolute statements, they feel comfortable to us, we like them, and so um, they feel good. Um, an, an absolute statement makes us comforted, right? And so what we, what we want to do is just, we have to be aware of that, but scientists don't deal in absolutes, just like a good Jedi. But I do love that the statement, only Siths deal in absolutes, because it's not saying many Siths or um, Jedi tend not to deal in absolutes um, with a really kind of high probability that, you know, if you're making absolute statements, you might be a Sith. See, that's not an absolute statement, but if you say only because of that. So this, these, these, you know, when you try to kind of button it up with, um, um, you know, here's, here's the, the, the answer, here's the absolute, boom, true, false, right? You're not doing inference right. And this is at first makes us feel uncomfortable and then it's incredibly freeing. Yeah. And the way we do this, the way we move the ball down the field is we don't assume we're right even when we have strong evidence. We show what our evidence is. We move our, the slider, the slider on our degree of certainty. We only, we only pre accept a claim in proportion to the evidence that supports it. We only accept a claim in proportion to the evidence that supports it. And that's different than, than this, this sort of true, false, good, bad, Sith, Jedi sort of a thing, All right? Um, so one last sort of example of how this ties into um, to science education. How has this come up? I have been, a, I'm regularly a science fair judge. Here's what I see at the science fair. For some reason, that experiment where the kid is playing different kinds of music to plants will not die. And it shows up again and again and again. And so here's what it is, is that the kid is gonna take a bunch of plants and they say, um, uh, they, they say that, um, I'm going to play um, Chopin to these plants and Black Sabbath to these plants. My hypothesis is the ones that hear Chopin will grow and thrive because it's more wholesome. And the, um, the ones that listen to Black Sabbath will wither and die. And then because they're terrible at horticulture and have a small sample size, some of them die and some of them don't. And they make a claim based on what happened with their very small sample size, right? Now, in this case, um, what is the impact? Of the, their question actually boils down to is what is the impact of playing different kinds of music and sounds to different types of plants? Is that a let's see or a could it be? It's uh, let's see. No, could it be? What What do you think? Could it be? I'm gonna go with could it be. All right. So the, we're going to we've, we're going to be playing music to plants, and we're going to observe what happens to those plants, whether they live or die. We can see it. Yeah. We can see well, what, now, so the, the first thing that they're doing, <coughs> they're doing an observational study. 
Yeah. They're doing a let's see. Let's play this music and see what happens. Right. right? And then we see some of them die and some of them don't. Now, if I then go, why did the ones that listened to Chopin die, right? <laughs> if I'm wondering why they did, that's a different question, right? That's a Many. could it be, right? We're now in the could yeah. it be land. No, and we have to sense. set up our why web. It could be because I've got a mm -hmm. small sample size and I'm lousy at horticulture. It could be that the vibrations of Black Sabbath inspire growth molecules of, you know, whatever, you know, I don't know. So, but the, 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 the study that they started off doing, I'm going to play this music and see what happens. That is an observational study. That's a let's see question. And with a let's see question, there are no hypotheses. Yeah. Hypotheses are only in here in could it be. And if you think about it, if I'm saying I expect the ones that listen to Chopin to, 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 to thrive, as I'm sitting there and making observations about things, all it's going to do is bias me because I'm now expecting to see them do better. And I'm going like, you're doing better? You're doing better? And they're kind of doing the same. You're like, mm -hmm. must be I'm going to find some reason to see what yeah. I'm supposed to see. So if you are coming up with a hypothesis in a let's see, then you're going to be biasing yourself towards that outcome. All right. So a whole bunch of science fair experiments are observational studies, and none of them should have a hypothesis. But they all have hypotheses because in the science fair, one of the things you have to do is state what your hypothesis is. They also don't have a bunch of science that gets done without hypotheses. It's a tricky thing. And see, this is where it gets tricky, and this is why that, it, and, and it's, but it's interesting. Once you kind of go like, oh, let's see, you just observe the thing and don't bias yourself, no hypothesis, let's just go find out. Let's play that music to it and let's see what happens. Let's tinker and see what happens. That's let's see land and it's good science. Messing about with those things is good science. But if I'm trying to figure out why, I can now no longer do a direct observa observation of why, but I can come up with my possible explanations and then make predictions off of those. Now I'm into hypothesis testing and I'm now in this language of uncertainty. I can say with certainty that this was my sample size and this many of them withered, right? And I can say, I, I can say that, you know, I am, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, like, you know, here's, here's what I controlled for and, 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 and these ones withered, these ones didn't. That's all observation, right? No hypothesis required. But we've all been trained that science, you know, you come up with a question and so you make your hypothesis. There's a bunch of questions that don't require a hypothesis. And if you use a hypothesis on those, then you're misusing the hypothesis because all it's going to do is make you expect to see a certain outcome as you are doing your direct observation. Establishes a bias. Yeah. Yeah. So what does this look like in your journal? You ask a question, you go, oh, it's a let's see question. I'm going to go check that out. I'm going to go, I'm going to go see, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, if it's a could it be question, I'm going to make my Y web. Mm -hmm. And sometimes right then and there in the field, you can test one of those, those possibilities. Um, and so let's, I thought that this would take me a half hour and then we spend the second half <laughs> discussing it. Um, but I've just, uh, it took us long to kind of pry the lid off this can of worms. Cause you see it's, there's complexity there and you see why people are confused about it. Right. Cause it's, it's nuanced. 
And what we've been doing is we've been treating all these questions as one type. But when you see that there are those three types of questions, those allow you to take the next appropriate step in investigating this. So um, I now am going to remove my spotlight and um, anybody who would like to share thoughts or ideas, even if you put them in the chat, I encourage you to share those. Um, and let's let's let, let's let's hear your thoughts on on what's going on here. Um, One of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about the science fair is sometimes that's the fun part of um, of doing it is to look at your biases and find the creativity to try to circumvent them because it gets you outside of your own head. And then also, I think it makes the science part of it more interactive. Um, so I, I just, that's one of the things I love about this discussion is thinking about how you can address your biases. And for me, that's almost more fun than getting other answers. So. That, that's a really great point. That's a really great point, Advia, um, that, that thinking about this part of it is fun, right? Yeah. It's, it's cool. And thinking about like, like, oh, I am, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's a classic joke of the person is in the parking lot um, kind of uh, at night and they're kind of looking around on the ground and a person walks over and says, is everything okay over here? And the person says, oh man, I lost my keys. And it says, where did you learn, lose them? And said, um, well, way over there on the other side of the lot. And why are you looking here? Well, this is where the light is, right? <laughs> Sometimes we're, 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 we're doing our searching just where the light is because that's, that's collecting your data where the poison oak isn't, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, thinking about your biases and um, uh, is, is a very powerful thing to do, All right? Um, any other thoughts or ideas um, on this? Comments and ideas. Hmm. Well, I'm worried about the future of science shows. <laughs> How can that, you know, still go on? Uh, the, the, the future of, of what? Of science projects and shows where it's wrong, you know, that those projects get filtered through lots of teachers and parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the scientific method, as it has been taught to us in schools, is something that happened that started in the 1940s. I think it was 1947, when one person wrote an article for a magazine about the things that scientists do. And in that kind of came up with this little kind of like, and they, they, they interviewed a bunch of scientists, they were scientists themselves, and they talked to a bunch of different scientists. And they said, um, they said, uh, you know, what are things that you do in the course of your work? And the scientists came up with this big long list of things. And then that researcher took those and said, look, if we take these ones and we put them in order, they kind of make a story like, mm, I've got a question. Oh, I can make a, and it, and it happens to be a, 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 uh, a why question. I can come up with some hypotheses. I can figure out how to test that. I can do my tests and I can analyze my results and I can get a result and then I can share that with other people. We should teach this in schools, just this process that scientists are doing. But that got picked up as the scientific method. So the real good news is that, um, well, so the scientific method as it's been taught to us is widely used every year, but not by scientists. Each one of the steps in it is a science thing, but that little linear process, sometimes they go on that and sometimes they're going off in different directions and then kind of come back to it. And sometimes they're investigating something and it's, it's a could and a let's see question and they're not doing that hypothesis testing at all. So the, um, it's used widely every year by science teachers and the science students who are who have to 
put together a science fair project. So where is this the scientific method used, right? The scientific method is used. It's used in science fairs. And um, but but not that's not what the scientists are doing. The good news is that the next generation science standards have been very explicit, and they they say. They, they say that whole the scientific method is wrong. There is no the scientific method. There are science and engineering processes that we use in a really complex and dynamic way. Let me bounce it back and forth between them to help us use observation and inference to make an understanding of the world around us, right? right? And so NTSS is saying that we should get away from that, the scientific method thing. And they, they specifically call out the scientific method as not being right. And so it's going to take a little while for science fairs to catch up with right. next generation science standards. But because it's clearly laid out in NGSS that like that's really not what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? you can do science and not have it be an experiment, right? Um, you can do science and uh, like if, if you have a hypothesis you need to make sure that that hypothesis is tied to um, a prediction coming off of a hypothesis, right? That's where, that's where it fits in. Um, so <clears throat> the good news is that this is built into next generation science standards. It'll just take us a while to get this into science education mm -hmm. yes. because our science educators have been taught, even people who are mm -hmm. giving conferences for educators are haven't come fully around to the understanding of like, oh, hypothesis, that's for, that's for when I'm specifically doing inference. And if I have a direct observation question, there's no hot, um, hypothesis that is happening in there. It will happen, it will take time. Um, but the good news is that in the standards, it's now really clear. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, another thought. One oh, thing that I that's right. So I, I'm, I'm, I am saying let's see, not no less see. Um, yes. Um, the, uh, so it's let's see. So when you want to make observation, let's, let us see. Let's see, as opposed to could it be or let it be. Um, sorry, sometimes I get so excited. They talk really fast, and then it's really hard to understand what I'm saying because then all these words are coming out, and they kind of slur together, and then it just makes a mess. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let me remove the spotlight. I'd um, love to hear um, any other thoughts or ideas from, from other um, um, educators. Um, Anne, did you want to say share something? Well, I'm not an educator, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just wondering if your method of I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of addresses this that the I notice would have to be the um, let's see, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. and the I wonder would be the could it be, could is it that, be? Yeah. does that fit in, is that what you're okay. doing there? Yep. So, so the way that I would, let me kind of map it out on a piece of paper, I'll show you, show you how I would think of how this ties with, uh, up with inner wormo. Inner wormo is I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of um, I'll get you a, a clear piece of blank piece of paper. And so for me, the process looks like this. Let's go to All right, um, can, oh, let me, ah, oh, there I am. So um, what I do when I go outside is it all starts with, I'm getting all this sort of weird light on the, the page here. Um, it starts with, there, 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 there's, there's a phenomenon, right? 
you know, you, you find something that you're kind of wondering about. And you're like, like what's, what's up with that? That little thing there, right? And you want to learn more, more about it. And so what you do is it starts with, you find some natural phenomenon. And that means something that you can, you know, that you can experience, you can see, you can measure. If you can't somehow detect it or measure it, it's just, it's not a phenomenon. It's outside the realm of science. But, you know, here's our little phenomenon. Right? And <laughs> so what I do is I am going to use, I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of to investigate this phenomenon. And off of these I wonders, I'm going to, so I, I first just start collecting information about it, right? I need to, you know, and I want to think creatively about it. I want to start asking questions. So step two in the process is I notice I wonder it reminds me of. And then off of those I wonders, I'm going to get several different types of questions. And some will be, let's see. And I'm going to answer those by continuing to observe them. Some of those are going to be, could it be? Right? And on those, I'm going to make my Y web where it could be A, B, C, or something else I haven't thought of. Or it could be let it be. And there, I'm going to write a song. I'm going to write poetry. I'm going to use philosophy. And, but not, but that's not part of my scientific practice. If I get back in here with my could it be question, I could take any one of those hypotheses if I want to pull this further down the field. I could take any hypothesis and kind of make prediction one, prediction two, prediction three, right? And then I can go and see if those predictions are borne out by my observations or my experimental results. So the um, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of is our interface between the phenomenon and our brain. And throughout this entire process here, I am journaling about it. That's super helpful. Fantastic. Yes. So if we have this scaffold in our heads, we know where we are and what we're doing at any point. And so when a question comes up, I can immediately say, oh, it's a why question. Um, and, and, and I'm Y webbing that out. Right. Um, you know, if I wanted to find out like they're going in both directions, are they making a new nest site? Like in order to figure that out, what would I need to do? Right. Um, I want to look at the sort of material that they're carrying. Are they carrying trash in one direction and food in the other? Well, that would make sense for the cleaning one. Right. Um, you know, the, uh, if they're making a new nest site, I would expect them, some of them to be carrying uh, maybe food back to the old nest, but carrying larvae and pupae and things back the other direction. So let's look at what they're carrying. So there's, there's specific predictions that you can make off of you know, any of these hypotheses. In other cases, um, you know, here it is, 
when do the ants go to gather new stuff? I look at that and I go, oh, it's a when question. A when question. A when question is something I don't need to do a why web on that. What I need to do is keep going back and looking at this. So I was there in the middle of the day. I looked there and there and I looked at sunset. Nope. And then right at 9 p.m. Yep, they are active. They're going out and collecting at 1 p.m. When do they stop? Well, I fell asleep, so I don't know, right? Um, but you can answer that when question through your direct observations. So the, um, the, these, these questions it could be who, what, where, when, how, and why. Um, a lot of the, all the whys are definitely could it be's. Um, you know, sometimes some of those other question categories are could it be's. Um, but a lot of the others are let's see. So I just did a let's see on those ants. And I now know that they do their, they go out and they forage and they collect and they bring stuff back and forth to the nest at night. Right. So that's how I, um, that's how I go, uh, uh, how, how those pieces fit together with each other. Um, I think that it is useful to have um, to have that framework in mind. Um, any other thoughts, comments, or ideas? I, I do have one, <clears throat> and um, it's about <clears throat> one thing that I would, <clears throat> I'm sorry, one thing that I would like to um, maybe look more at so at some point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're right, I do need that. Um, is to look at one thing I love about this process is is how dynamic it is, and as scientists, a lot of times that we'll we'll look to try to observe and to try to understand and get ideas for how the world works. But then also there's other times when when in science we're using what we're doing to you know different practices, whether it's that somebody's in medicine, or mm. somebody's doing habitat restoration, or working with animals or something. And so I wish that there was some sort of way to. Um, to think about how and also to teach kids how to integrate the, this process into actions that we take so that, that way we're always um, aware of, of how our actions are impacting you know either the environment or people or animals that we're taking care of and then constantly modifying what we're doing in order to make sure that we're taking the, the healthiest possible action or if we see something's not working then to use then to go <clears throat> back to this process and think how are we going to alter it um, what we're doing in order to make it work more. So I wish that there, that that was the sort of thing we taught in schools was how to how to turn this process also into action. Yeah, that's a really good thought. Um, and because the more that you are that you understand what your process is, it allows you to be deliberate in in what you're doing. Absolutely. Other thoughts and ideas? Mm -hmm. Or can anybody I want to sort of um, add to what uh, Iveo was saying um, or, or a different thought along this line. I think it's important that we um, let have kids see that it applies to their lives. I like what she's saying about the action, that it's not just thinking, it's also doing and changing our behavior you know, based on what we see. Right. And, and that's, that's exactly why science has been such an effective tool in helping us understand um, how, uh, how things work and, and, and manipulating things, sometimes with great results and sometimes with disastrous results, but it's a, a very effective. You're, you're, the idea of looking at evidence for kind of clues of the way that stuff works is the reason that the technology that is making this Zoom call work right. and you're seeing me, that's because people were doing exactly this process. Right. And we, it allows us to figure out things about the physical world. We allows us to figure out things about how the natural world works. Um, and what Avea is saying that we want to, you know, also kind of have an opportunity to take action at appropriate points, can we have our action based on evidence? Mm -hmm. 
a strong personal feeling about something, if it's not based in evidence, is just that, a strong personal feeling about something. And if you look around this country right now, you will see people who have strong personal feelings about things, and it points them in completely opposite directions. So which way do you go? So the strength of your feeling about something is actually not an indicator of how accurate it is. <laughs> Unless you want to take the very hubris mm -hmm. of assuming that you're right on all of these That's things. Serious. Some of them you are, and others you're not. So what we want to do is on these um, I, sort of ideas and strong feelings about things, <clears throat> We need to go back to what is the evidence for that. And you see, with, with this, this process that we're looking at there with the hypothesis testing, kind of one of the hidden strengths of that that's really interesting is that when you're doing that, one of the things that's most successful in moving the ball down the field is if you get a lot of, if you've got an idea and then you can come up with a lot of evidence that shows that it doesn't work, and then you can essentially cross that thing off with some air bars because maybe you made some mistakes in your assumptions. Um, you know, you know that that's not it. You've moved yourself closer towards understanding what is going on. Um, so scientists very often are in the business of trying to falsify a hypothesis or find can can I really get so I'm not trying to prove that I'm right. What I'm trying to do is when I'm doing my tests, what the tests do is that if, if this outcome doesn't come out that way, I now have actually evidence against my favorite theory. So if you are trying to, by trying to disprove your pet ideas, you make them stronger. It is not disloyal to your favorite ideas, um, but you are, um, but by trying to your best in a legitimate way to knock holes in it, um, I see how strong my, those thoughts and ideas are. And that's true in science. So every test of a hypothesis is set up that if you don't see that, that's going to be something that is tearing down that hypothesis. So you're trying to it's, it's called trying to falsify your ideas. And it gets you in a really different headset and, and, and mindset than if you are trying, if you're just trying to find evidence that supports an idea that you like, you will be able to find that evidence in just a couple of mouse clicks, no matter what you're thinking, right? So the, the idea is that human beings have this propensity for what's called confirmation bias. That's doing, worth doing some research and looking up. Confir bi confirmation bias is the um, you know, arch demon of all of our cognitive biases. And it is behind most of um, the uh, errors in thinking that human beings do. And it comes to all of us very naturally. And so that process of trying to, you take an idea and then trying to build an experiment that is going to, uh, that, that, that is an honest test of it, that if this doesn't go the way that you want, you've got now a whole bunch of evidence against your favorite idea. And that evidence piles up and you go like, oh, I guess my idea is wrong, right? If it's a way of trying to force yourself not to do confirmation bias. And that's what that, that, that hypothesis testing is set up to do. And, but then you also have to remember it's a human endeavor and who is doing it, it's, it's humans and humans make mistakes and humans have assumptions. Sometimes humans are driven by wanting to get money and sometimes humans are driven by wanting to get fame. And sometimes even scientists, as much as I love them, they want to get money and they want to get fame. And they too, because they're human beings, will do things that like they shouldn't have done. Right? They make mistakes. And that's why in science, we're not saying I've got truth. We're getting ourselves slowly closer to a more accurate understanding of what is going on in this world. 
And step by step, we're getting closer to it. And sometimes we say it's a step backwards. Yeah. And, and that, that happens because the people doing it are human beings. So, so we try to do things like peer review and these sorts of things. It's the reason that we, we you know, often do tests with, you know, uh, uh, that, are, that, are, that are double blind. So that, you know, I'm not saying I'm expecting the ones that heard Mozart to thrive. Right. Um, somebody else is looking at how well those plants did, because th it's it's just that we're humans. But um, in a different workshop, we can kind of unpack, you know, things like you know why are people doing double blind and stuff like that if we want to. In another workshop, we can do a, actually a deep dive into kind of looking at, um, you know, when we look at a bunch of of published scientific papers. A bunch of those are wrong, right? Like a bunch of those are wrong, and um, and and what do we do about that? Does that mean that this whole process doesn't work? Well, no, that's that's not true because you know, you look at you know all sorts of ad advances in in science. You know, a few years ago, HIV was a death sentence, and now it's an inconvenience if you can get the right medications. And it is and now places where it is a death sentence. That's because of you know, lack of distribution of, of medicines and, and political priorities. Um, but you know we we can we can look at sort of how the process is done in, on on, an, on another level and how it goes wrong and the degree to which it is a self correcting process. But um, understanding how those could it be questions fit into the whole equation is really, really important here. Really, really important. So I want to thank people for, for joining us today. This, this educators forum, I'm, I'm apologizing. Um, I, I knew kind of going into it that this might just end up being a John Muir Law's diatribe. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I wanted, I, I've never in our workshops um, kind of blocked out the framework for what is going on with these different types of questions. And I think for us as science educators, it's incredibly powerful to understand that because it is widely, widely misunderstood. And that affects our um, our understanding of what science is and how science is done, what we can count on science for. Um, you know, when people uh, look, point to a scientist changed their mind about something, right? You know, and that's somehow evidence against science. So sort of in, in, uh, there's, there's like some people are, are saying that, you know, people like Fauci said this at this point, and now they're saying this. This is evidence that you cannot count on, on Fauci. I'm going to actually get a little prop here. <clears throat> Putting all my cards on the table. I'm somebody with a Fauci bobblehead. Um, the, uh, so, um, so if somebody changes their mind based on evidence, evidence. That is a good thing, right? And we should all strive to do that. Um, so as the evidence is changing, if your narrative and your um, your um, and, and, and your assessment of uh, of a claim is not changing, then what is happening is our emotions are getting in the way of this process. So we try not to have ourselves emotionally attached to any claim, but attach yourself to the process of following the evidence. So don't identify yourself as faith to any claim, any scientific claim. What you want to do is be willing to kind of go, you know, what, what does the evidence show? And again, we support a claim in proportion to the evidence around that claim. 
and it's not. Um, so if somebody says scientists believe that, nobody cares what scientists believe. You shouldn't care what scientists believe more than any other people. I mean, sure, we should pay attention to what each other believe, and that's nice. But why should you care what a scientist believes more than anybody else? Because we don't care about scientists' beliefs. What we care about is scientists' assessment of the evidence, right? And so that's that's so um, belief is a evidence-free zone. So you, we can hold ideas in our head independent of evidence, and that's that's a belief. Um, so when we're talking about scientists, if somebody says scientists believe that, then um, they're not really understanding also kind of what's going on with, 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 with science. Um, again, we, we support a claim in proportion to the evidence. And we will change our mind when the evidence changes. And if we're not doing that, we're not paying attention. So um, there are some interesting ideas here that applies to how we think about our science education, um, and also, you know, how we how we respond and and deal with with uh, changing landscapes of of, of evidence. Um, evidence coming out around COVID nineteen. It's a very rapidly changing. Um, uh, environment. Um, so my, my wife is an infectious disease specialist. That's why how we got this. Um, and um, I, I listen every time they have these, um, uh, Stanford and a number of other universities have these big meetings where all the scientists and all of the doctors are getting together and they're sharing the data. And I get to look at these people on a regular basis changing their minds and updating their um, opinions about what is going on. And um, there are still major things that stay consistent, but as you know, at the start, things are changing like this, and then they're changing like this. And then, you know, as we get new evidence, you know, it's looking at the, um, you know, it seems now that it's, it's, becoming increasingly solid that 40% um, of the people with, with COVID are asymptomatic, right? And earlier studies were saying maybe it's, you know, 20. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's less than that. Maybe it's more than that. And now it's, 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 it's kind of the numbers are coming around and it's coming back sort of around and more studies are sort of saying, yeah, it's sort of right there around 40. And so people are, they're, they're changing our, our, our minds about those sorts of, 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 of details. And those have implications of the kind of ways which we want to protect ourselves and our families. Um, and that's the way it should be. Um, but don't be afraid when people are changing their minds based on, on evidence. Um, and actually, a final, one final thing, kind of a, a, a challenge for everybody. <clears throat> so some of the things that we, feelings that we strongly have are based on evidence. The ones which are not, what our brains tend to do is to cherry pick evidence so we can say, see, I actually came from evidence on this, but we actually didn't get to that position through an analysis of evidence. We got to that position because of social pressures that are on us and people who we hang with. And, um, and on those things, if you change your mind, we fear ostr being ostracized from our, our kind of core community. Um, which means that there's lots of potential in a polarized society for our strongly held feelings about things to drift further and further from the evidence. Um, consider that for everybody on this call, no matter their pro political persuasion, some of the things that you strongly believe and feel are evidence-based are wrong. Because they are. 
uh, I mean, sure, there's gonna be somebody who's a statistical anomaly out there who happened to just be right on everything, but that's not me. And statistically speaking, it's not you, right? Um, so knowing that, look for opportunities to change your mind in the presence of evidence. And in some cases that may challenge allegiance to your core group. And um, be willing to change your mind in those sorts of things. And it's scary to do. Um, once things begin to get politicized, um, our kind of team affiliation becomes kind of kicks in and overrides our reason. But um, if we can take this process, which we've talked about, kind of looking at squirrels and wood rats and apply it more largely to kind of how we operate in society, we have a potential to move more towards, um, I think that moving more towards I, I would like to have personally a bunch of you know thoughts and opinions that are actually based in reality. I think that that would be a good thing, which means that I have to be willing to change some of the things that I think. And and um, so think about what was the last time you changed your mind about anything of significance, and if it has been years, then. Um, maybe there's some some soul, heart, and mind searching that might go on. Um, and uh, it's 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 fun to sort of take this approach to sort of thinking and reasoning. And again, so don't I, I with myself, I try not to kind of connect myself with any specific claim, but I want to be connected with a process of looking at and analyzing evidence. So that makes when somebody disagrees with me, instead of them being a threat to who I am, I actually lean into that conversation thinking, oh, goody, maybe this is the opportunity that I've been looking for because it actually has been a while since I actually changed my mind about something. So it actually puts you in a conversation with them at a really different level where you're actually authentically curious instead of defensive. Because you're looking for like maybe you be my, my, maybe you'll be my next key, but and it keeps us in that place of like really assessing the evidence. And so I'm teaching my girls to do this. I teach my two daughters to say, "Oh, that's really interesting. What's the evidence for that?" And they do it to me now. They've done it to their teachers at school. They say, "That's really cool. What's the evidence for that?" <laughs> um, questions, thoughts, idea from the community. I, I, I feel like I have to confess that I'm an old enough science teacher that I taught it the wrong way in the 1960s. And uh, I understand it a lot better now. Yeah, um, um, I, I taught the old way. I, at my outdoor education school, um, I wrote up this sort of journal that people could, could bring with them. And there's this scientific method part that I put in where you're kind of writing your hypothesis. I've been in the woods with kids where we're kind of on the spot developing experiments and things and kind of looking at how we'd investigate things and having people jack a, a, a hypothesis into observational studies. I was doing that about once a week. Yeah, with controls and positive outcomes. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. So we just, but this is something where you go like, oh, I can change my mind on that. Hey, everybody. Uh, we are now uh, 39 minutes over our time. Um, this has been quite, uh, uh, and there's actually, it's on, and it's down just to the 10 of us. <laughs> so um, I hope that you uh, enjoyed uh, <laughs> here with all of us. And, uh, uh, and, and thank you for being here. Anybody want to uh, share any parting thoughts or goodbyes to the community? Why Bob Ross? Oh, so the tag team here, um, art and science. Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so together.
these guys. That's yeah. pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, so it's my uh, art and science. And Bob is taller, so I have to hold uh, the, the, the Fouch up. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thank you. It's really good to see all of you. And uh, thank you much, so much for being here. Ray Bonto, it's good to see you again, my friend. Um, the, uh, and um, everybody, take care, be safe. Change your mind in the presence of evidence. Um, and uh, life is going to do the best we can. We're, we're, we're fallible human beings, and we're just doing the best with our meat brain to kind of puddle through this world and make sense of it. These strategies seem to be really useful. And we may find down the road that this approach is wrong. And then we'll just have to change our minds. <laughs>